Hi friends, this is Terry Squires with today's Nashville, This is Faith. I sat down with Gary Sinise, Lieutenant Dan. You don't want to miss his episode. There is always someone around you in need of encouragement, your smile and your words of hope. You know him as Lieutenant Dan in the movie Forrest Gump, Gary Sinise. His stage, film, and television career has spanned more than four decades earning him numerous awards and nominations like the Emmys, Golden Globes, Oscars, and many more. And you can find his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. In the midst of his career, Gary has stood as an advocate on behalf of America's service members, earning awards to name a few, the Bob Hope Award, the Congressional Medal of Honor Society's Patriot Award, and the Presidential Citizens Medal. But it hasn't always been easy for him, facing trials and heartbreak. Today, he shares his passion through the Gary Sinise Foundation, changing the lives of our veterans. This is his story. This is today's Nashville. This is Faith, part two. Gary, in your book, you received an award, which was the National Commander's Award. The National Commander's Award. And I read that there was one word that just stopped you when you were receiving it. Can you tell me about it? Well, in the, in the award, it, it says something about, um, you know, wanting to thank me for... Uh, bringing the veterans. You know, bringing bringing uh, veterans back into the consciousness of the American public. And I thought, why are we, why do we have to bring them back? They should just be there, <laughs> you know. Uh, these are our defenders. They, they are, you know, people that sacrifice in service to our country. Uh, they get hurt, they get killed, they give their lives, they give their limbs. We should not be bringing them back into our consciousness. They should just be a part of our, our, uh, our daily love and, and care and support. And so that struck me a little bit in, in the award, the awards over on the wall over there. And I thought, well, you know, maybe there's something I can do about that and uh, to help with that. I played Lieutenant Dan, he's a, he's a double amputee, a Vietnam veteran, blown up in the jungles of Vietnam through the DAV. And this is uh, the disabled American veterans that gave me this award. Uh, at that time, they had 1.5 million members, and that's 1.5 million wounded veterans as members of their organization. So that was, a, that was an impactful moment when I walked out on that stage, and I describe it in the book in the very f first pages of walking out onto the stage and looking out in the audience and seeing 2,000 wounded veterans out there applauding me for playing this this part in, in Forrest Gump. Uh, they had shown some uh, video uh, from the movie on the screens before I came out. And I remember standing backstage uh, kind of, and I could hear my voice on the screen, you know, screaming at the hurricane, screaming at God, you know, whatever they were showing there. And then they introduced me and I walked out on stage and they were, everybody who could stand up was standing. And then there were others who were in wheelchairs and they're, they're applauding me for playing Lieutenant Dan. And it was very, very moving, very impactful. They presented me with the award. This is 30 years ago now. And from that moment on, I just, I, I stayed in touch with them and I wanted to support them in, in small ways. But, um, then, you know, shortly after, I mean, seven years later, we had uh, the attacks on our country on September 11th. 
And that really changed me in, in, a, in, a, in a big way. There's a chapter in my book called Turning Point, and it's the September 11th chapter. It's the chapter where I talk about how I felt that day and, and for, the, for the days after and months after and how it affected me and, and uh, how heartbroken I was and, and wanting to do something. And so I thought, you know, having been involved with, with Vietnam veterans going back into the 80s, I got very involved with Vietnam veterans in the 80s when I was working at Steppenwolf, actually. As an artistic director, I wanted to find a piece of theater that would speak to the Vietnam veteran experience. And I found one that was written by a group of Vietnam veterans called Tracers. And it was, originally it was written by a group of Vietnam veterans and they were performing it. And I went to see it in Los Angeles, fell in love with it, was very, very moved by it and wanted to direct it at Steppenwolf in Chicago, which I did. And that led me to start getting involved with local Vietnam veterans groups in Chicago. And this is back in the 80s, 10 years before Forrest Gump. So when Forrest Gump came along and I'm playing a Vietnam veteran and I'm invited to the uh, national convention of the DAV and they present me with an award, I just knew, you know, I was something was happening at that point. I was being prepared for what would happen when we were attacked on September 11th. And that was a true turning point for me uh, to service and service work. And uh, there, there, was, there was no going back after that. I mean, it was, it was profoundly impactful and I, I just knew that I was gonna be very heavily involved with supporting our, the men and women who were deploying to Iraq and Afghanistan, their families, uh, those who were getting hurt, you know, the real life Lieutenant Dan's I started supporting and all that grew into the Gary Sinise Foundation. You talk about that in your book about going over and visiting the veterans or our service members um, in Iraq and what was that like? Yeah, the first, the first trip I did was in uh, June of 2003. So. 21, 21 years ago. And I volunteered to go uh, to Iraq on, on, this, on the first big USO tour that, where they were taking entertainers and everything to Iraq. And I, was, I went as an actor and uh, you know, there was all kinds of people entertaining, Leanne Womack and Kid Rock, all these different people were, were entertaining. And I was Lieutenant Dan, shaking hands and taking pictures and signing autographs and, you know, talking with the troops and that kind of thing. And that was, that was a gigantic moment. Uh, as soon as I got back from that trip and I, I, I met thousands of troops, I called the USO and I said, where can I go next? And so within three weeks of getting back from Iraq, I was in Italy doing a tour, military bases all over Italy. And then I got back from that and the next month I, I said, where can I go now? And then I went to Germany, did a tour in Germany. Uh, and uh, then, then I went to Fort Stewart and Walter Reed and Bethesda uh, Naval Hospital. And, and then I went you know, back to Iraq. You know? So for six months, I was just, I wasn't working at the time. <laughs> so for six months, I was just doing all this work with the USL and traveling with the USL. And that really solidified and galvanized this mission for me that because I could see what showing up on a military base or a military hospital was doing for somebody. It was lifting them up. It was helping to raise them up. Well, tell me about the Gary Sinise Foundation. You have a lot going on. You have so many different programs. Let's talk about them. Yeah, and the, the foundation grew out of all this stuff that I was doing before that. You know, what does an actor do uh, when he wants to go support the troops? You call the USO and you go out there and do it. So that's what I did in the beginning, but then I wanted to do more. So I started volunteering for all these nonprofits. I could see that there was this, this nonprofit supporting the troops, this one helping the wounded, this one helping our first responders, this one helping uh, the families of our fallen heroes 
all these different nonprofits, and I was raising my hand and saying, what can I do to help you raise money, raise awareness, do all these things? So I ended up getting involved. In fact, this, this right here, this call to action list that you see right there, that's about 25 or 30 nonprofits that I got involved with before I started my own. So I learned a, quite a bit from a lot of these nonprofits about the, you know, where, where the needs were and how to try to fill those needs. And I was just wanted to do more for as many people as I could, so that's why I volunteered for so many nonprofits. So at a certain point, I'm like, gosh, what, what's, what, what am I gonna do next? And the clear uh, direction for me was to start my own nonprofit. And that's where the Gary Sinise Foundation came from. And the reason I put my name on it is because, as I said, I was doing all these trips, I was doing all these hospital visits, raising all this money, doing all these different things. And so I had built up a pretty solid reputation, you know, over about a 10 year, 15 year period for helping our veterans. Uh, and people knew I was serious about it. People knew that, that it was something that was, uh, I was passionate about and that meant a lot to me. So I thought, well, I've made a, a reputation here, a, a trusted, reliable reputation with our military community and with people who are seeking ways to help our veterans. So I slapped my name down on the Gary Sinise Foundation. And I said, I'm going to put my name on it because you're going to trust it. You know, if I put my name on this, that means I'm going to back it up with, with action. And that's what I've tried to do ever since uh, 2011 when, tr when we officially launched at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. And now we're in our 14th year. And we've, we've done a lot and we've, we've helped a lot of folks and a lot of people have helped us to help a lot of folks. So you're doing smart homes, is it building homes and the Lieutenant Dan Band, you're out there raising money. The foundation, we have multiple programs and initiatives, you know, from giving grants to building homes to entertaining to, you know, um, to first responder events. We provide equipment for first responders. I mean, there's so many things that we're doing at the Gary Sinise Foundation. And the reason the mission is so broad, you know, why we're doing so many different types of things, helping our, our families of our fallen, these children who've lost a mom or a dad in service to our country, kids of first responders, police officers, firefighters who are dealing with a loss of, you know, mom or dad, you know, uh, line of duty death. I mean, we, we help a lot of people in, in multiple ways. And it's because, as I said, because before I started the foundation, I was involved in a lot of different things. So when I created the foundation, I just wanted to continue that but I wanted to provide the American people with a means to support me doing more. And I always say we can never do enough, but we can always do a little more, and that's what we're doing at the Gary Sinise Foundation. You talk about a gentleman in your book uh, during the 9-11. I'm going to take you back to your faith that he lost his sons, and he is the one who really uh, challenged your faith or... Yeah. His name is John Vigiano, that's who you're talking about. So John Vigiano lost two sons on 9-11. Uh, one was a police officer, uh, Joe, and uh, the other, John Jr., was a firefighter. And they were both at the towers and the, when the towers came down. John uh, was a retired firefighter, legendary New York firefighter. He had every award you can imagine. He was, everybody knew John. And I happened to meet him on my first trip to Iraq. He was a 9-11 father. He was a, a, he was, served in the Marine Corps, legendary firefighter. And he wanted to be on that first big USO tour to go over and thank the troops. I sat down next to him on a C-130 going up from, from Kuwait to Baghdad. And I didn't know who he was, and I sat down. He didn't know who I was either. And uh, I sat down next to him, and he had a button on his shirt. It's right over here. It had two sons on it. His two sons were there. And I said, what's the button? And he said, those are my, those are my sons. They were killed at the towers. And I said, oh, my. 
tell me about him. So he started to tell me about his son. We're flying up, we're flying up from Kuwait to Baghdad to go see the troops up there. And he tells me all about it. He reaches into his backpack. He gives me an FDNY hat and he takes the button off his shirt and he hands it to me. And he gave me the button and he gave me a hat. And we became fast friends from that moment on. He invited me to come to, to the firehouse where, where his son John was serving. They lost six firefighters that day from that firehouse, ladder 132, uh, engine 280 in Brooklyn. And uh, he invited me to come to the firehouse. So three months after I got back from Iraq, I was in New York at the firehouse and I met all these folks who had lost friends and loved ones, you know, who were serving in the FDNY. I started raising money for them, started doing all kinds of things. And I got to know John very, very well. He's a Catholic, uh, strong Catholic, a faithful guy. And, you know, I would always ask him how, he's, how, he, how he got through that, losing his boys. You know, his faith was strong. And he introduced me to the Monsignor uh, of, the, of the, the fire department in New York, Monsign Monsignor John DeLendick. I, my, my wife had become Catholic uh, back in 2000, um, kind of went back to her Catholic roots. And I was really, you know, and, and the, the Catholic Church and the Catholic faith had been very po positive for our family going through some very seriously difficult times. You know, seeing what the Catholic Church had done for my wife and how it helped her through um, very serious alcoholism issues and, um, and to recover from that, um, it just became a big part of my life. And uh, I remember, remember I, I hadn't been confirmed in the Catholic Church, but we'd been going to Catholic Church for 10 years. And our kids went to Catholic school. And I remember surprising my wife uh, uh, in 2010. Um, uh, one night, uh, Christmas Eve, I said, we're gonna go out for Christmas dinner. We're gonna take the kids. And I had a surprise. We stopped at the church on the way and the priest was there and he was ready to confirm me into the church with the family. And that was our Christmas Eve, 2010. And uh, the church has been very, you know, very, very positive through some very, very difficult times for our family, especially recently, you know, with uh, everything let's, that's happened. Let's talk um, about your son, Mac. I have his new album, Resurrection and Revival, just came, just released. So sorry to hear about his passing. Let's talk about his music. Well, Mac was... Uh, this is my son, Mac, uh, McKenna Anthony Sinise. Everybody called him Mac. He's actually named after my wife's older brother who uh, was a Vietnam veteran. He died in 1983. So we named him, we named Mac after, after Moira's brother, Moira, my wife. And, uh, and when he was nine years old, I got him a drum set. He was always kind of tapping on things. So my wife and I decided to get him a dr drum set. And he sat down the first time out and I was able to teach him like the basic rock beat. It's just a very simple rock beat. Your foot does one thing and your this hand does this and this hand does that. And he could do it like right away. And I thought, whoa, he's nine. You know, a lot of kids wouldn't be able to coordinate their limbs like that, but he was able to do it. And it was, it was fantastic. And he started playing from nine years old and he played all the way through high school. He ended up going to USC Music School, Thornton School of Music. He studied composition and songwriting and all these things. Ended up writing a bunch of great music. He was diagnosed with a very, very rare, serious cancer in, in 2018. It's a rare cancer called Chordoma. And uh, I mean, so rare that on average, every year, only maybe 300 people in the U.S. are diagnosed with this. It starts in the spine. It's a tumor that grows in the spine. About 70% of the time, they can take that tumor out and it's gone. It's cured. It's gone. But about 30% of the time, it'll come back. And 
I'm so sorry. Sadly, that's, that's what happened to Mac. It came back and spread. And so he fought that for, for five and a half years, and he died January 5th. He was a very faithful guy. I know his faith helped sustain him through some very rough stuff because it disabled him. He couldn't walk. Couldn't play music anymore. He was part of the foundation too, didn't he work here? He worked at the foundation, uh, started working at the foundation in 2017. He was diagnosed in 2018. He kept working through 2019, but then the last thing he did for the foundation was he created a podcast. Hello and welcome to GSF Podcast, sponsored by the Gary Sinise Foundation's Education and Outreach Initiative. I am your host, Max Sinise, and today we have a very special guest with us, my dad, star of stage and screen, Gary <laughs> Sinise. <laughs> and he did two episodes of the podcast, but then he had to go back in for more surgery and that disabled him so much he couldn't return to the foundation. But we've just recreated the podcast. We've revived it in honor of Mac. We built a studio right over here. It's the Max Sinise Memorial studio and we've just revived resurrected and revived the podcast his album uh, came out recently it's uh, sold 3400 copies already it's now on uh, all the digital platforms spotify and and itunes and everything it's out there now and you know he wrote so much music that after he died, I started pouring through his iPhone and his Dropbox and all these files, and I found all these musical treasures that he never told me about, that he tucked away and wrote. So now we're working on part two of Resurrection and Revival, and we're gonna bring that out in the fall. I can't wait to listen to it. Now, how did you get to Nashville? Well, I have, uh, Nashville, it's interesting. I've, I've lived, as I said, I moved to California in 87 with the family, started having our family there. Uh, did well in the movie business. Two or three years ago, I started thinking that, you know, maybe, maybe it might be time to look for a no tax state <laughs> because the taxes are going up in California. It's crazy, you know. Um, we're getting a lot of people here, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, it, it's expensive. <laughs> it's expensive there. You pay the weather tax there. Everybody loves the weather. <laughs> you pay the weather tax for sure, among many other different, different things. But I just started thinking about a change for the family and uh, started looking at Florida and Texas and Tennessee. And I have, you know, I'd been coming here for a while, you know, doing things at Fort Campbell, um, you know, I, I actually became a uh, an honorary member of the 160th Aviation Regiment, the the um, the Night Stalkers. Um, they're Special Operations Aviation folks um, at Fort Campbell. They made me an honorary member. I, I've done played concerts for their gala a couple of times. Have many friends here, and then then it was a couple of buddies of mine that had a business in. Uh, in California, and they told me they were gonna to move to Nashville. And, and they had about 150 employees, and they said 125 of them are gonna make the move. And I thought, well, I've been trying to figure out which, where to go. I think I'm gonna focus my energy on Tennessee and really start looking around. We found a great house. I moved the foundation here a couple of years ago and everybody loves it. And then my daughters moved here, their husbands both work for the foundation. My uh, nephew and his family moved here. Uh, my wife's sister moved, we, we made a, a big move. <laughs> it's a great, great city. You're gonna be playing at the Grand Old Opry soon, right? On Sunday, yeah. So do you go, does the band go out a lot? And Well, yeah, we're, we're going out this weekend. We're, we're playing at, um, Fort Leonard Wood, we're playing at Fort Knox, and then we're going to the Opry on Sunday. The Opry is doing something really fun um, called uh, the Opry celebrates 30 years of Forrest Gump. And so we're gonna have all the artists on the bill at the Opry are doing songs from the Forrest Gump soundtrack and my band will, will be there. Um, it should be a really, really fun, fun night. It's my first time at the Opry. Um, 
but they've been wonderful. They're a wonderful group of folks. And obviously, we've got a great, great group of artists on the bill that night. It's going to be a lot of fun. Gary, your book is called Grateful American. Today we're living in crazy times, um, but we still have so much to be thankful for. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm absolutely a grateful American. I, uh, I, I remember when I started writing the book, uh, my agent encouraged me to just start of, you know, I've been doing all these trips with the troops and overseas and all these different things. And uh, she encouraged me to write some of it down. So that's where I started with the book. But then it turned into an autobiography. And then when I started, you know, finishing it up and really reading it, this recurring theme of gratitude kept just popping out of the book. And I thought that's the name of the book. I'm, I'm somebody who's grateful uh, to live in this country. I'm grateful for the men and women who have served uh, in defense of this country, who have sacrificed in defense of this country. One of the programs that we have at the Gary Sinise Foundation is specifically focused on our World War II veterans. And there was never a time in the history of our country where, or the world where freedom was more thinly on the line you know, there were only two choices at the time. At that time, you either going to have tyranny and oppression, or you're going to have freedom. Thankfully, the men and women who served during that period of time with the Allied powers, they won. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for what we have because of the sacrifices that have been made. Uh, this is an experimental country. You know, there's, it's unlike any country on earth where people from all over the world come to this country uh, for a better life. Um, I, I'm grateful because I was born here. I'm, I'm an American uh, from, f from the first minute and I'm grateful that I am. I want to do something to help my country and I thought after September 11th, what, what am I going to do? I was, I was afraid after that day. I was scared. And I thought, I've got to do something to help. So having veterans in my family, I just raised my hand to start helping our defenders out. Uh, where would our country be without the men and women who raise their hands to serve our country uh, and protect our cities? We'd, we'd be in a lot of trouble. So I am indeed uh, somebody who's filled with appreciation and gratitude for those folks. Uh, I want to do everything I can to help them. I want to be a reliable means for our fellow citizens to be able to reach out and touch them and help them. And that's why I created the Gary Sinise Foundation. I hope that we're here for many years to come doing a lot of good things to help people over the years. Gary, thank you. You are so loved and I'm sure it's gonna be here for a long time. Thank, thank you for sitting down with me today. Yeah, it's my pleasure, thanks for having me. My friend, is the Lord calling you back to a place that he needs to take you? Trust Him today. This is today's Nashville. This is faith.